Impact of Influence, the tragic story of a powerful South Carolina family and the mysterious deaths that they are linked to. Hi there. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am Matt Harris, seated across from me, Seton Tucker. We are honored that you're spending time with us. Always grateful for anybody who listens. And uh, if you'd like, you can rate this podcast when it's over and share it. And also hit up Murdoch Podcast on Facebook or MurdochPodcast.com. Coming up in this episode, what do we have, Seton? So we have a new property listing that we are going to talk about. We also have lots of court stuff that happened on Valentine's Day. And we have a few new lawsuits that were filed. And we talked to John Snyder, our ever popular legal analyst. But we begin with a guy who was one of the first reporters on scene when the murders were reported of Maggie and Paul Murdoch. You might have seen him on the Oxygen special we were on about Alec Murdoch. And he works as a great reporter for News 2 out of Charleston. He's Riley Benson. Riley, thanks for joining us. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me on. Let's start with the fact that you were in court this week. And you were in the courtroom, which they've been doing all virtual. Was there right. other people with you in the courtroom? Uh, yeah, this week there were uh, several attorneys and lawyers in uh, the courtroom in Hampton County. It was, a, um, it was about 60 items on the docket this week, so a healthy list for Hampton County. But uh, several of the attorneys involved in the Murdoch case, uh, Joe McCalla, Mark Tinsley, uh, we saw them in court this week. Obviously, Alec Murdoch did not leave Richland County to come down for that hearing, but we did get to see some people in court. It was actually nice for a change. Yeah, really. Yeah. Well, one thing before we talk about the actual uh, motion to strike was I noticed on the docket, and I, I did listen to your live stream, was that some of the cases had Alec Murdoch still listed as an attorney of record. I saw some giggling about that. What was your take on that? Those were cases that had previously been assigned to Alec before everything had gone down. And those cases were kind of put on hold because they had to be reassigned to other partners within um, the law firm if that's still a thing at this point, but <laughs> they're going to be assigned to other attorneys that are working with Alex. So Alex's name obviously will be taken off those. He can't represent those, <laughs> those clients. Anymore. I don't think people want Alex well, representing them. The judge said, I, I noticed the judge kind of said, well, that ship has sailed. And there was, there was kind of some giggles about that. I think before we get into it, we need to mention that Judge Price was the same judge that upheld the redaction of the police reports related to the deaths of Maggie and Paul. He does have some other connections to the Murdoch cases. He does. And I, I will say it was kind of strange to see Judge Price on this. He's from Charleston, but he hasn't been involved as recently as, you know, like Judge Lee um, or some of the other judges that involved. So it was interesting to see him jumping back into the, into the fray, if you will. Yes. So let's talk about the motion to strike. So that was uh, simply a motion by Alec Murdoch's attorneys. And this wasn't Dick Harpootlin or Jim Griffin. This was John Tiller, who's Murdoch's insurance lawyer. Motion to strike some of the accusations in a lawsuit that was filed by Connor Cook. And to give quick background, Connor Cook being a, a boating passenger in that 2019 fatal accident that Alex's son Paul was uh, driving at the time or accused of driving at the time, killed Mallory Beach. But... Murdoch's attorney looking to strike some of the accusations. There were several paragraphs in the lawsuit that they were looking to take out, a lot of them in relation to the events that happened at the hospital following the boat crash. Of course, this is when Connor Cook and other passengers have alleged that Alec was going room to room to room in the hospital trying to get the same story among the boat passengers. Connor Cook claims that Alec Murdoch was trying to steer blame from Paul as the driver at that time to Connor Cook. That's part of the lawsuit that was filed by Connor Cook's attorney, Joe McCullough. That's been on the record for uh, more than a month at this point. That was hearing in court, and John Tiller was trying to get some of those accusations struck. He called them scandalous, calls them meritless. Um, McCullough is basically saying that those are factual claims by his client and that they should stay in the lawsuit because either way they would come likely come out in a trial uh, against Alec Murdoch. So he didn't see a reason for those to be struck. He also says that those claims and accusations speak to the character of Alec Murdoch. That's Joe McCullough's um, argument against taking them out of the lawsuit. He says that speaks to who Alec Murdoch was, who he is. And this isn't the first time, essentially, they're saying this isn't the first time they've seen stuff like this or at, you know actions like this of Alec Murdoch's. This is the introduction of February 24, 2019, Connor Cook, a 19-year-old minor, 
who had lived in Hampton County his entire life, was a passenger in a boat driven and crashed by an intoxicated minor, Paul Murdoch. Earlier that day, Paul Murdoch, although not of legal age to purchase alcohol, went to Parker's convenience store where Parker's violated South Carolina law and its own policies in allowing him to purchase large quantities of alcohol using the driver's license of his brother, Richard Alexander Murdoch, here and after Murdoch Jr., which would be uh, Buster. The driver's license, along with the third-party credit card used, should have alerted Parker's upon reasonable scrutiny that the driver's license and credit card did not belong to Paul Murdoch. And then this is where they really get into Paul Murdoch's history. After consuming this alcohol through the day and into the early morning hours of February 24th, 2019, Paul Murdoch, drunk and traveling at excessive speeds down a narrow creek into the night without a proper lookout or proper lights, as you remember, they were using flashlights as right. lights, crashed the boat belonging to his father, Richard Alexander Murdoch, into the Archer's Creek Bridge with such force as to eject several of the boat passengers into the water and caused Connor Cook to strike his body on the boat frame to lose consciousness and awake with a serious cut to his face and multiple fractures to the jaw. And then, of course, the life of Mallory Beach was lost. So that's the part they said was... Scandalous. Scandalous. Um, We also have... What else, uh, Seton, to ask him about? Well, so that the, there were several other motions that were supposed to be heard that same day, and a lot of them were related to the Satterfield case that were not heard. There was a motion to dismiss uh, Murdoch filed by the defense team. Mm-hmm. There was also a gag order and sanctions against Eric Bland mm-hmm. and a motion to dismiss or in the alternative to stay filed by Bank of America. And then mm-hmm. there was the Liz Pendens filed against Moselle and the Edisto Beach House. All withdrawn. Yeah, all of those were withdrawn in relation to the Satterfield case. I think Tinsley still has his lens pendants in place. Yeah. What do you? What did you? Uh, what was your take on those being dismissed? Well, it was um, it was an interesting morning. Obviously, you know, going into it, we were expecting to hear several motions. Um, Eric Plain and Ronnie Richter didn't show up that morning. Um, basically, when the Bank of America thing came up, it came up first, and it sounded it was kind of hard to hear from where I was sitting, but it sounded like that had been settled over the weekend. Um, Still haven't seen the terms on that. Now, I know as far as the gag order, what I've seen is that Harputlian and Griffin had pulled that back. The Liz Pendens is another thing that was unclear. It wasn't presented in in court in the hearing as as what was going on. It just said that that had been moved or had been pulled back, had been withdrawn, and they would maybe hear that at a later date. That was interesting because obviously I think we're going to get into this a little bit later, but that kind of came ahead of the house being Moselle being listed for sale. And that Liz Pendens was obviously on Moselle. Uh, Mark Tinsley's hearing or motion didn't make it to um, the docket or didn't, we didn't get to hear it. Although I think it was supposed to happen on Monday morning. That one, we asked Tinsley about that after McCullough's and he said it wasn't happening on Monday. So uh, it was interesting. It wasn't, it kind of was like last minute because like I said, like I mentioned, going into it, we were expecting to hear a number of things uh, related to Alec Murdoch and, and the different ongoing cases. All of those being pulled back was, it seemed to be, to me, it was unorganized. Maybe it was a last minute thing. The judge kind of seemed maybe caught off guard, or at least the clerk was caught off guard by it. Um, but like I mentioned, you know, Ronnie Richter and Eric Blaine weren't there Monday morning. So I, maybe that was a, a forewarning as to what was to come. Yeah, it sounds like they were making some deals. That's what, it sounded like it sounded like there was some deals that happened over the weekend that weren't, you know, maybe official or on the record yet, because uh, that was pretty much what the judge, Judge Price, had said about the Bank of America, that that had been settled. Um, so that was obviously connected to the Satterfield case. And there was talk of that Liz Pendens by Murda, or by Bland and Richter being pulled back, but nothing was ever officially announced on the record in court on Monday morning. Yeah, and it has been reported in the Island Packet that all of those motions were withdrawn. So the house goes up for sale, the Murdoch home, where Alec's wife, Maggie, and son, Paul, were murdered, goes up for sale, listed for $3.9 million, which can you tell us about it? Obviously, you know, this is the the family's longtime hunting property they were, you know, living at at the time of this had gone down and where. Maggie and Paul were shot out by the dog kennels. Alec comes home to find them. Obviously, we get a first really good look at the dog kennel on the listing of the property. Todd Crosby is the realtor out of Walterboro who is, has listed the property. Now, I spoke with Todd on Monday. He had told me that a 
personal representative for Maggie's estate, which would be John Marvin Murdoch, was the one who retained him or you know asked him to list the property for sale. This was something that was agreed upon back in January by uh, lawyers, according to Mark Tinsley. When I spoke to him on Monday, he said that he, when he was surprised it took this long for that listing to go public or to be at least put on the internet. He says that he says that there's one offer that's been made on the property. Um, when I spoke to Crosby, he told me there have been several offers on the property. No buyer has been identified at this point. Obviously, it's a more than 17 acre or 1700 acre sprawling property. It's two and a half miles of riverfront. It's got tons of hunting opportunities. It's got tons of land, ponds, several auxiliary buildings. There's a secondary house on that property. Like I said, a very sprawling property that it's up for sale. And the interesting thing here is if it does, if it were to be sold, the question is what happens to that money now? I believe it would go to the receivership for them to decide, you know, can, Alec could obviously ask if he could get $5 million, $7 million for his bond. Most likely scenario, I would think, is that money, the receivership would somehow deal that out to alleged victims of Alec Murdoch if it were to even hit that 3.9 selling point that's being asked for. Another thing, though, is there is a mortgage still out on that property, that house. Uh, I've heard $2 million, haven't had that confirmed to me yet. So you're looking at a $2 million mortgage on a property that you're selling for $3.9 million. If you get that number, it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. And 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 all of the interested parties, if they'll let the list pendants go, that's another thing. Mark Tinsley hasn't acknowledged or said whether or not he's going to let drop his list pendants on that property, which, you know, that legal issue could hold up any sale, sell in, in court if it were to get to that point. Uh, it's something that we're continuing to closely watch, obviously. I want to mention real quick for the people to know what the uh, Liz Pendants is. It is uh, a filing by an attorney to say that the property can't be sold in, in a nutshell, right? That's that's basically what it right. is. That's great stuff, man. The, the fact that it was on up for sale in January or they had contacted somebody is amazing to me that that was held under wraps this long. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's great. That was a shock to me when I talked to Tinsley and he said, and even he was surprised, like I said, that it took this long for that listing to be put up because he said they all the attorneys agreed to this back in January that, you know, we want to sell the house, get the money. Obviously, the interest there is in divvying it up to give to alleged victims. One of the things we read in the description, 12 dog kennels. We're really not sure how big the dog kennel area was. No, and we did hear from our right. sources that the dogs that were there at the time of the deaths of Maggie and Paul were safely rehomed. So, I mean, obviously, yeah. this this property has a lot of history and, you know, bad things that happened there. So people would have to get past that if they would want to buy that property. Obviously, the first thing that comes to the front of your mind is is Paul and Maggie's death on that property. Yeah. You know, obviously, Gloria Satterfield's death was on that property. You know, outside of that, a lot of history, like you mentioned, you know, this was a property that they used to entertain people. And often cases, you go through Maggie's Facebook, um, you'll see tons of pictures of various family members uh, at Moselle for hunting, you know, occasions and and different things. You see Paul and his girlfriend, pictures of them back, you know, years ago when all this had gone down uh, at Moselle. So this property, obviously, it means a lot to that family. But, you know, there's also been um, a lot of, you know, tragic events that all have also happened on this sprawling property for the family. So going back to the deaths of Maggie and Paul, you were one of the mm-hmm. first people on the ground. Probably the biggest story you've ever covered. I mean, I don't know, but tell us what that was like. I mean, without a doubt, that was certainly the biggest story that I've have ever covered, you know, my short time in, in journalism and news. But um, I remember that morning meeting for our, our news team. We have one every morning, 930. Uh, in the morning meeting, you know, none of the reporters, nobody wanted to go to Hampton County. Nobody, I had no clue, you know, obviously where Islandton was, I had no clue um, where Moselle was. So I drew the short end of the stick that morning. Thankful I did it now, obviously, but make that hour and a half drive out to Islandton. And I remember it, it had rained that night before um, the grass, you know, was wet. There was a ton of law enforcement sled at that point had been there. Not a lot of media at this point were, you know, camped out on the side of this road. Um, it was June. It was still kind of cool. Um, but I just remember seeing uh, John Marvin Murdoch walking down the driveway with sled. And this was the first point that we thought, uh, you know, we were going to hear like maybe a press conference or a brief or something from the law enforcement that was on the scene, they came down the driveway that's closer to the dog kennels, the shed. So if you're unfamiliar with the property, there's two driveways. The first um, driveway doesn't seem like they used it a whole lot. The second one went to that secondary house and then the barn, the shed, dog kennels. That's where pretty much everything was centered at that point that morning. 
nobody was really at the driveway that's closer to the house. Uh, I just remember, you know, a ton of law enforcement presence. You couldn't really see where the crime scene was. Obviously, we we came to know that it was a very expansive crime scene, but it was it was quiet. I mean, there was nobody wanted to come out and talk to you and tell you what was going on. You could hear the dogs barking at that point back in the crates, the kennels. Um, so obviously, they were still there at that point that morning. It was just you know a lot of questions. I do remember at one point it was either Alec or Buster had came down the driveway in the truck and it had the license plate has the initials on it. So you knew it was at least one of them or could assume so. And, and they were obviously not friendly, didn't stop and talk to us, kind of came out and you know sped up the road on, on Moselle Road. It was just kind of interesting going through the different things. And I think the biggest thing we would come to learn in the coming days is obviously the influence, the power, but a sense of fear. Nobody wanted to talk about the Murdochs. You know, I went door to door to door from not a lot of houses nearby, but went and knocked on the neighbor's doors or called the neighbors. And, you know, nobody wanted to say anything other than, you know, they, they were a good family. Maggie was a good person. It made it tough to try to gather and to, to put something together on, you know, maybe a family or not hidden in the, in the woods, but, you know, I think they had stayed out of the spotlight for the most part in the recent year outside of the boat crash. So it was kind of hard to gather information and, and kind of put together a bigger picture of what we were, you know, experiencing that morning. And you didn't get any word from law enforcement, right, until uh, the Colleton sheriffs the next day? Well, that, that's the other thing is we, we didn't get anything from law enforcement. Everybody was tight-lipped. The, the biggest thing we were told is, you know, we can't comment on an ongoing investigation, but there's no threat to the community, which I think to me, to a lot of people, that was... That's a, that was certainly a comment that caught you here. There's, you know, no threat to the community. There's no reason to be worried. But you just had two people who were, you know, brutally murdered on a property in, in quiet little Colleton County where not a whole lot happens. So that I think that was something that caught your ear, raised some eyebrows. You know, obviously, we didn't hear a lot from law enforcement at some point uh, in the following weeks and maybe months. We would find out, you know, Alec was considered a suspect, um, you know, but that was really it. We didn't hear anything that would, you know, back it up or guarantee that he was being investigated as a suspect, just that he was someone who was not a suspect, but a person of interest. He was being considered as a person of interest, which isn't shocking when you're the person who would find, you know, the bodies and you're obviously the husband and the father. So it wasn't something that caught us totally off guard that he was named as a person of interest. Outside of that, like I said, there was nothing other than there's no ongoing threat, no reason to be worried. So, you know, that leaves you the question of, well, you know, what, what aren't you telling us? What don't we know? Why is there not a threat if, I don't know, it was just, it was weird. Well, it's also kind of led to this gossip mill. Like, for example, last weekend that, you know, I'm, I'm sure you heard about the death of an inmate in the jail where Alec is and people are like, is this right. something happening? And of right. course, it, you know, came out that this was not Alec or doesn't Nothing appear to, to be relate, him, yeah. related. So kind of, I think this lack of information has created this kind of gossip mill. How is that as a reporter? I will say it's it's very tough, I think, as a reporter, at least for me, because you have to separate the actual, the factual, you know, provable information that we can report in, in the gossip or the rumors or the, the different things that are being put out there. You know, there's tons of people, um, obviously, who are interested in this case. It's, you know, garnered national attention at this point. But, you know, there's Facebook groups, there's Twitter, there's different podcasts, there's different you know, groups that are just reporting on various things. And you have to be very careful about, you know, what you're reporting. Even when it came to Monday morning in the court hearing, a great example, you know, Friday afternoon when I left News 2, you know, we were looking at a docket of 60 plus items with several, you know, motions, different things involving Alec Murdoch come to, you know, come Monday morning, we only heard one, two things. So, you know, it's ever changing. It's, you have to be very careful about what you're putting out there. You know, you're still at the end of the day talking about, um, you know, the unfortunate death of, of two people, uh, death of other people, you know, deaths of other people. It's these are human beings. Uh, obviously, there's been, you know, a lot of rumors and, and hearsay, but you have to be very careful about what you're putting out there, because ultimately that that comes back to you at the end of the day. It's uh, been great talking with you, Riley Benson. Keep up the good work. Riley Benson, uh, Charleston, Mount Pleasant News 2. Is there a uh, handle on Twitter or somewhere they went to if they want to find you? Uh, it's uh, at real Riley Benson, not the fake one, but the real one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I appreciate it, Riley. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, I appreciate man. it. After a quick break, we'll come back with our legal analyst, John Snyder.
Before we go any further, Seton, I want to tell you about a very cool podcast, and everybody else about this cool podcast. It's this popular con theme podcast called Chameleon. Love the previous seasons. I've just listened to the new season called Wild Boys. In 03, in British Columbia, Canada, small town, these two starved young boys show up, known as the Bush Boys. And they have this story that they were raised in the wilderness. Oh my gosh, I remember hearing about this. I can't wait to listen to this podcast. Because it takes crazy twist. And they, they come out and they start talking to them. The town starts feeding them and helping them out. And they say, it's the first time we've ever seen society. Uh, they've never seen a TV, never gone to school. Just like raised in the woods. Oh, wow. But there's a problem. <laughs> Everything they said was not true. Uh, it's really brave. They break it down, how this psychological drama happens. And there's never before heard interviews. This comedian and journalist, Sam Mullins, uh, grew up there. And he tells a story, really great at telling the story. But these kids tell this crazy story. Turns out to not be true. The twist and turns are all available for you. To hear the story, search for Chameleon Wild Boys on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening now. Winter can wreak havoc on your skin. Hey, it's Kayla, and it's not just the weather, but as a new mom, I've seen my skin change in ways that I'm not too happy about, but that's where the Skin Center has you covered. Their most popular treatment is Botox because they're the best at it. They've been ranked a top 10 provider in the nation by Allergan Aesthetics, the makers of Botox. And their best facial is what I got. It's the Hydra Facial. It exfoliates, extracts, and hydrates all at once. So save your skin from these winter blues and DM at the Skin Center MD on Instagram and mention code Kayla to get one hundred dollars off your first botox or filler treatment or any skincare package now we bring in our legal analyst john snyder who was a former da and former defense attorney uh seaton let's start with the lawsuits from this week brought on by morgan doty and also miley altman explain So Miley and Morgan have both filed lawsuit against Parker's Corporation, Gregory Parker, Richard Alexander Murdoch, Buster Murdoch, Richard Alexander Murdoch Jr., John Marvin, um, as the PR for the estate of Maggie Murdoch and Paul Murdoch. And in this lawsuit, I actually kind kind of found interesting, was they talk about how Maggie talked to Paul early morning on the night of the accident. And the Island Packer reports it was about two hours before the crash. And she failed to stop, is what the quotation is, failed to stop him from driving the boat. And remember, just a little background, you may remember Morgan and Paul were dating at the time. Also, they bring up in this new lawsuit, which are the sixth and seventh civil suits, that Maggie Murdoch liked social posts depicting her son drinking alcohol while underage. So the lawsuit alleged Maggie and Alec had actual and constructive knowledge that Paul Murdoch, their son, would drink to excess and drive vehicles such as the family boats. They say Paul Murdoch was, quote, was incompetent, unfit, and or reckless based on his almost constant consumption of alcohol and that his behavior was, quote, condoned, encouraged, and facilitated by his parents, including on the morning of the boat crash. John Snyder, as I said, is here with us. What does that uh, set off on your lawyer alarm? Yeah, the first thing that I hear is the sound of stretching. At this stage, you're starting to have some, in my opinion, credibility in your claims, where you have really strong and clear claims at the beginning the addition of these claims starts to, you know, you're starting to overplay your hand, in my opinion. Now, their approach may be, we're going to kitchen sink this. We're going to make every claim possible and colorable under the law so that we make sure we recover as much as we can on the big ones. But I, I still think a mom liking a Facebook post of their son is a tenuous claim and the idea of proving it since she's no longer with us based on the valid and strong claims they have against other defendants. So that kind of brings up a question that one of our listeners sent me and said, how does a civil suit work when a defendant is deceased and the plaintiff isn't a standard creditor? 
with a receipt for a due debt. So, you know, obviously the estate of Maggie and Paul have been named in these new lawsuits. So how does that work? The law creates what you call a legal fiction where the estate is substituted as the real person. So for the purpose of a lawsuit, we assume that this person is alive and can be sued directly. A couple situations would be, you know, when when people sued the 9-11 bombers and, and terrorists that, you know, even though the terrorists died in the plane crash, they were still sued because they were the ones that did something wrong. And so the law has a, a clear remedy that just because you're deceased, uh, tort claims don't die with the tort fees or, or the, bad, the bad actor dying. But that begs a question with Maggie specifically, she wasn't on the boat. She wasn't a part of the boat trip. Uh, she wasn't a part of the law firm. She wasn't, part, you know, I just think it's it's starting to, to get silly in some regards on attributing behavior to her. And there's no way for her to defend herself. Two other things I want to point out about these new lawsuits. Uh, one, that Morgan and Miley's suits are the first civil actions to name as defendants the estates of Paul and Maggie Murdoch. And I also want to point out that in the lawsuit, they say that Morgan suffered injuries to her hand, finger, and other parts of her body. And both Morgan and Miley spent money for medical services and lost wages, uh, etc. So I wanted to point that as well. Uh, we move on now to other legalese and something you predicted about the Liz Pendens, uh, again, explain what a Liz Pendens is, John Snyder. So, so a Liz Pendens is a, is a giant flag that is planted for all the world to know that a piece of property is in, under controversy and people have an argument over who is the true owner or who has an ownership interest in it. And you thought they wouldn't hold up. As far as the who who were the two people, Eric Bland had a Liz Pendens on behalf of the Satterfield heirs, which has been dropped. But Mark Tinsley also has a Liz Pendens that he has filed, but that one has not been dropped. And and uh, John, that doesn't surprise you because it seems as though uh, Bland and the attorneys have come to some sort of agreement with Bank of America and all that, which we talked about. So they don't need it anymore. Do you think Tinsley will be following suit? I think he should, based on the obvious and clear law of South Carolina. Again, he has money claims against the estate of Paul and now, you know, potential money claims against the estate of Maggie. But he does not have any claim of actual or apparent ownership in the property. And there'll be both a motion to dismiss or a countersuit filed by the estates to have it removed for slander of title. You know, basically having something on there that prevents them from being able to sell it uh, because it shouldn't have ever been filed. So the only other thing I think we need to talk about was on the hearing that was held on, what was that? Valentine's Day? Yeah. Monday? There was a motion to dismiss a private investigator services group from a lawsuit filed by the Mallory Beach attorneys that accuses Parker's convenience store CEO and his lawyers of creating a social media campaign intended to bully the Beach family during the wrongful death litigation against the convenience store. And you told us, I think you think that's a stretch. I think that's a huge stretch. The PI has a job to do. He's been hired to do it. And their firm has a letter of engagement and is recognized in South Carolina as uh, at, through a licensing process of what they can and can't do. And uh, even though the, the claims are being made, I think the motion to dismiss is was appropriate and, and yeah, was appropriate to file and should be granted. So, John, there's something you wanted to talk about, a legal maneuver coming down the line from the attorneys of Paul Murdoch's estate were the look to have the suit dismissed. Now, that's based on what? If one of the people in the boat knew that he was drunk, why did they get in the boat with him? 
we haven't heard those arguments yet, but they're coming if these cases don't settle. Wow. They clearly knew, and they begged him not to drive. When they file that, let's say Harpootlian does that, it's not going to go well with PR. However, his job is to defend his client. That's right. And those would have been issues raised. You know, you had somebody die, but did, did you know, anybody that was hurt in that boat did they know that he had been drinking to the, you know, to the, to the point that it was apparent that he was? Um, and if they did, then, then they're going to claim there was an assumption of risk or a waiver of, of responsibility because they could have gotten off the boat or were they drinking themselves? Uh, th- so those, these are tough issues, but, but they're coming down the pike as these cases start to, to sift out and and things get a little clearer on the on the, on the boat accident itself. Thanks, John Snyder. Thanks, John Snyder. Thank you, guys. Talk again. Thank bye. you. All right. Bye. All righty. Uh, if you want to reach out to us, a couple of places. Tell them, Seton. You can reach out to us on Facebook at Murdoch Podcast and on our website, which is MurdochPodcast.com. Please take the time to rate this podcast if you enjoyed it and. Also share it, and we will talk soon. Winter can wreak havoc on your skin. Hey, it's Kayla, and it's not just the weather, but as a new mom, I've seen my skin change in ways that I'm not too happy about, but that's where the Skin Center has you covered. Their most popular treatment is Botox because they're the best at it. They've been ranked a top 10 provider in the nation by Allergan Aesthetics, the makers of Botox. And their best facial is what I got. It's the Hydra Facial. It exfoliates, extracts, and hydrates all at once. So save your skin from these winter blues and DM at the Skin Center MD on Instagram and mention code Kayla to get one hundred dollars off your first botox or filler treatment or any skincare package hear that is that america cheering or a sausage patty sizzling to perfection it's time to cheer for egg mcmuffin and fresh cracked eggs at mcdonald's it's time to wake up to the aroma of freshly baked biscuits and treat yourself to a real honest to goodness morning meal breakfast it's on at mcdonald's now get any breakfast sandwich for just two bucks available only through the app Mobile order and pay available at participating McDonald's. McD app download and registration required.